Okay, so once we've ruled out the treatable causes of dementia, then we have to start going to Alzheimer's, and it is the most form uh, common form of dementia in people over the age of 65. Uh, in the U.S. right now, about 4.5 million people have it that we know of, and the prevalence tends to double every five years beyond the age of 65. So we're going to see a huge rise in this as the age of the population increases. There are two types of uh, AD. There's the family, which is FAD, and then there's uh, what, and that has an inheritance pattern. And then just the sporadic, and that's with no obvious inheritance pattern. Um, the AD that's described as early onset occurs in people younger than 65. That is very rare. It occurs in about 10% of the cases, and it affects people between the ages of 30 and 60. The most typical is late onset, and that's uh, occurring in those over the age of 65. Alzheimer's disease is also uh, more common in women. We really don't have any kind of treatment for Alzheimer's. I mean, we can treat some of the symptoms and we can maybe slow it down with some of the new medications that we have. But when you have a disease that's non-treatable, you start looking for the causes and you start looking for risk factors. You know, how can we intervene? How can we stop this? Especially with the huge cost of Alzheimer's, this is really a big society problem at this point. So causes, most of the time we don't know. 75% of the time we think it's genetic and environmental kind of playing together. 25% of it uh, is going to run in families. Late onset family stuff, 15 to 25%. Early onset family is about 2%. So luckily that's a very small, small number. Down syndrome can be associated with AD, and it's an expression of a certain gene that causes the plaques in the central nervous system. It's rarely um, inherited in a typical genetic fashion. Now, uh, risk factors, advancing age, of course, and then family history. They've also done some genetic testing and then looked at uh, different alleles that make it more likely to uh, develop Alzheimer's and also some that actually help um, prevent and confer some protection. But the thing is, even though they have looked at all the plaques and all the genes, they still don't know why some people who have all these plaques have absolutely no symptoms and other people have a lot of symptoms and barely any plaques. There's a lot of stuff they're still trying to figure out with that. Now we do know that lower le levels of education are um, consistent risk factors for uh, Alzheimer's disease, but we're really not sure why. And we do know that people that have more education, that are more intelligent, tend to present with Alzheimer's uh, a little bit later on because they're able to kind of hide the symptoms for longer periods of time. We talked about Down syndrome being uh, an increased risk, not, not a huge one, but it is there. And then vascular risk factors. So just because somebody has a lot of risk factors doesn't mean that it's vascular dementia. It can still be Alzheimer's and you still will have the vascular risk factor. So how do you like that? Um, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and then depression. We talked about that as well. So all of those are risk factors. So what are the things that we can do as far as risk reduction? Well, alcohol is okay and maybe even protective as long as it's in moderation. Patients need to be encouraged to eat a well-balanced, uh, nutritious diet, drink lots of fluids. They need to be encouraged to uh, participate in physical exercise. All of that reduces their risk of Alzheimer's. Reduce exposure to toxins uh, whenever that's possible. Sometimes they get that in a work environment and there's not a lot they can do about it, but when it's possible, they definitely want to um, decrease their uh, risk. Some of those toxins would be alcohol, heavy metals, organic solvents, those kinds of things. So they need to reduce that when possible. Think about your polypharmacy. You're actually putting your patients uh, at risk if you are having them on lots of different medications. Now, I'm kind of saying the opposite because I'm saying make sure you treat hypertension, make sure you treat your depression, make sure you take care of dyslipidemia, but don't do polypharmacy. So I don't know how you're supposed to get all that accomplished, but get it done. 
one thing that you could do is you know exercise and nutrition so I always stress that that will be that will lessen the medication that you have to give uh, vitamin E is probably the most common um, multivitamin kind of nutritional kind of thing that we do uh, use for uh, Alzheimer's but there hasn't been a lot of data to support that but probably it has the most research on it so probably doesn't hurt anything early onset presentation and hopefully this is when you're going to get to see the patient um, they're going to have declining mental function memories probably the first and it's the most prominent sign in addition to memory loss they will have difficulty paying attention concentration judgment language calculations uh, spatial disorientation and language function and the MMSE covers a lot of these um, early AD is suspected when the patient presents with complaints of memory loss without other neurologic complaints and I've said that like three or four times so it's it's pretty important um, if they have motor coordination gait abnormalities and it's very early on in the disease it's probably not Alzheimer's you need to be looking for something else it's, when it's not early on the patient often is not aware of their deficits or they downplay them or they're in denial with them so when you're doing this kind of evaluation you probably almost always need family or friends or caregiver or somebody else present besides just the patient and remember that not all deficits are going to be present in all patients um, other than memory loss and then language problems tend to be early on everybody doesn't always have the same deficit and again your more intelligent higher educated people are going to score high on an MMSE uh, maybe even into the second stages of Alzheimer's so they're going to be able to kind of take care of that uh, longer so there's, you're going to see some variation with that. When we're talking about subjective, it's just the things that we've been talking about. Um, early symptoms can be really subtle. One of the things that I always do in primary care, instead of like doing an MMSE, is I ask the patients what their medicines are. Can you tell me what medications that you're on and why you're on them? And that should be give you a pretty good indication of where they are in their cognitive function because every adult patient should know what medicines they're on and why they're on those medications the only you know exception that I can think of that is that I have been in clinics where a lot of the patients that I saw were not able to read so if they're not able to read then probably they're not able to remember their medications and doses that puts them at a severe disadvantage but it most patients should be able to remember the medications and doses and if not then you may have an issue and you may need to kind of uh, address that a little bit more uh, difficulties in learning uh, new material forgetfulness losing things getting lost in familiar surroundings uh, difficulties naming people or objects uh, vague uh, speech inappropriate use of pronouns it thing they can't grab the word that they're trying to get they seem to have a decreased understanding of spoken and written language. Uh, behavioral changes are common throughout the course of disease and they're going to affect about 80% of your patients at one point or another. So you may see some disinhibition, you may see some inappropriate behavior, agitation, aggression, uh, delusions, violence, incontinence of bowel and bladder uh, later on with more severe disease. With objective, the appearance is usually normal. You know, sometimes they may be a little underweight, especially if they live alone. Um, they may look a little disheveled, but other than that, they will look pretty normal. Language can be impaired. Um, mental status exam is going to show memory loss and other cognitive deficits. Basic neuro exam is going to be pretty normal. Uh, they have some spatial disorientation. That's common. They have apraxia which is the reduced ability to perform motor task, um, impaired ability at learned or copy task, uh, impaired ability at stereotypical motor task, inability to recognize uh, people or objects, inability to recognize objects by touch alone. 
and in advanced disease you're going to see even more abnormalities uh, maybe them repeating words that they've heard or repeating sounds over and over that's going to be later hopefully that you're not going to see that when they first present and then you're going to do the diagnostics that we previously discussed so those are the things that you want to do to make sure or try to determine if you're dealing with Alzheimer's so what are your responsibilities when it comes to treatment well you need to take immediate action and you need to exclude your other possible diagnosis um, you need to assess safety you know are they driving are they wandering off are they cooking all of the, those kinds of things have they been violent at all um, all of those things so think safety and that's a big thing that you need to talk about you need to go ahead and refer as soon as you can uh, especially if the patient's younger or if you think for any reason at all that there is a psychiatric comorbidity or there's a behavioral disturbance you may want to uh, send to a neurologist or a psychiatrist but I would probably myself choose to send to a neurologist and you need to do that for any patient with new onset dementia or any patient who has any type of cognitive decline now if this is a family history of Alzheimer's then you especially in a younger patient that's when you may start thinking about consultation with genetic counselor those kinds of things um, once AD is diagnosed that is an ongoing education for the family and the patient on the prognosis treatment options it can be very detailed and very compliment, um, complicated you can refer them uh, to uh, books there's lots of information it, this is going to be most likely a very long process patients need to have a nutritional consult social worker they need ongoing support services and you need to evaluate who's going to be there with them who's going to take care of them um, you need to take into consideration the patient and family values and you need to always be thinking about the highest quality of life possible for the patient these are the medications that you're most likely to see um, I have started these in, in primary care and I can't remember exactly why I was the one to start it because I would think that this would be uh, something that the neurologist uh, would start and maybe I was just following up with it or maybe I was just increasing the dose I can't remember exactly why it's been a long time since I kind of had the population of older people but I've had I've been in practices where that was the majority uh, of my population and that's how I got really interested in gerontology and the study of aging because it seemed like that was most of my patients and I was very interested in, in them and, and trying to help them and now I'm taking care of all young people so it's kind of strange but these are the four approved medications for mild uh, Alzheimer's disease with moderate you can make some changes uh, antioxidant nutritional herbal complementary therapy there's lots of things that have been researched but evidence is kind of lacking on that uh, you're not going to be taking care of anybody with severe Alzheimer's disease hopefully maybe if you're in long-term care maybe you would be and you need to know more about these medications but it's really the side effects and maybe if you're asked to uh, increase the dose on these different medications or maybe they come to you because the patient's not tolerating something that the neurologist started them on and they want to change medications or they've seen something else on the internet all those kinds of things so you know you just handle that the way that you would with any other specialist which is try to refer them back now your job as family practice is really going to be taking care of the patient but also taking care of the family because you're likely to know the other family members and what's going on with them and there can be a lot of anxiety and depression associated with caring for uh, people with Alzheimer's disease so you need to kind of be aware of the whole picture and all the people involved but this is kind of the lowdown on the medications. I don't really expect you to know anything about them, but I think that you need to be um, familiar with them. Primary care follow-up. I mean, that's going to depend on the stage of the disease, what are the illnesses they have, the type of treatment that they choose. Um, I mean, they may be 20 years 
you know, and you may see them for the five to seven years that they're in mild stages. So, you know, if it's progressive but it's at a slow rate, then you can see them every three to six months, but also always let the family know if there's any acute changes or, you know, behavior like violence, anything like that, that you will be glad to see them earlier if you need to. Support for caregivers is one of the most important issues, like I said, that we have uh, in primary care. And you do want to see them every three months, but if that produces a huge burden on the family, then maybe you can stretch it out to six months. Symptoms can be helped by the medication, and sometimes the medications can help control the, the symptoms or the behavior types of things. The course of the AD is going to vary from person to person. Some people are going to have the disease five years, others up to 20 years. It is progressive, and ultimately it does lead to severe disability and death. And the most common cause of death is infection. And lots of times the infection will come up and people will choose uh, not to treat because it gets to the point of why do we want to continue to be extremely aggressive if they get pneumonia next time? That's those sorts of things. So all of those are things that the family has to deal with and, and talk about. Comfort, quality of life, and the preservation of dignity um, is always going to guide your management. As it does, you know, we're in peace, so I don't think I have to even tell you that. Non-pharmacologic interventions, um, education, they need to be making a lot of decisions now if they're in the early stages of Alzheimer's about their will, about uh, their living situation, and what that's going to be as things progress and how they're going to uh, handle things. They need to have education on nutrition and rest and exercise for mood and behavior control and preserving the routine. You know, it's a lot easier to sleep at night if you don't nap during the day and get reg regular exercise and those kinds of things. Um, try to keep them involved in activities. They have to be monitored for safety, confidence in cooking, driving. Um, it gets to be a real issue uh, when to stop someone from driving because you're removing uh, an adult independence and so this gets to be a huge issue. You have to think about uh, finances and um, just everything needs to be planned because it's it's a downhill slide so you have to address all this early on. Caregiver resources, there's lots of support groups and networks, um, home health, there's respite programs, adult daycare. This tends to be a 24-hour job and again these people get up uh, a lot, roam at night and so uh, it's hard for the caregiver really to get any kind of sustained rest 